So welcome to this episode of Silver Lining for Learning. Uh, we are delighted today to be able to look at uh, 360 Ed, which is a company that has made a big difference in Myanmar and now is scaling into other areas. And it also is unique because it's using immersive learning of different kinds, AR and VR, in, in ways that one doesn't often see in global South countries, but, but clearly should because it's a very powerful technology. So with me today as co-hosts are Yang Zhao and uh, Kurt Bank. And um, I'm going to just turn things over to you and your co-founder and husband, Lala, to talk a little about yourselves and about 360N. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. Ming Lawa. Uh, I'm the Lao Wen, and this is my partner in crime, uh, Yan Mei Ao, uh, go by Min. Uh, we both uh, born and raised in Myanmar, but we have been very uh, fortunate to have chances to study abroad in the United States for our both bachelor and master degree. And both time we were given uh, very generous scholarships. So we would like to, uh, by the time we graduated from US, we came back to Myanmar and uh, the last time studying at the Harvard, uh, we were very um, compelled to start anew. That time we were parents. Previously, we looked at education as a uh, teacher's educator and a school founder and whatnot. Uh, but, but when we were in Harvard together, uh, the place where, um, the intellectual half, I would call it, you know, the, the MIT and Harvard and, you know, uh, Tufts and Bard and all, I mean, the BU and all these uh, cluster, the professors, kids go to the, you know, schools, near neighborhood. And then when we visited the school, we were very intrigued by the trend that is shaping. We studied in the state uh, 10 years ago before that and the trends changing in the more uh, flip learning and you know uh, using technology. So we were very compelled to come back home and make a difference. And the timing was also very important for us. The timing, uh, 2016, it's the right time. And because uh, we came from Myanmar, born and raised, uh, we've been very uh, happy to be part of this uh, important uh, transformation phase. A um, little bit about Myanmar, maybe um, Min can share. Right. Um, it was also the, the decision was also very personal. Mm -hmm. And um, from the very beginning, uh, we always wanted to come back to Myanmar and to contribute uh, to the society. And it was never been a problem problem for us. But uh, when we got our our daughter and things, you know, our our thinking kind of change, especially in, you know, in the Cambridge and, you know, uh, and the, the education opportunity for our daughter is amazing. And, uh, you know, coming back to Myanmar to, you know, to live our dream uh, seems for us is quite a bit selfish and, and you know, uh, 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 not having our, our daughter having this uh, opportunity that he, she might have probably mm -hmm. in, in uh, Cambridge. Uh, so we, uh, decided to go into the, you know, well, this is just our kid. But what about, you know, uh, millions of other kids, you know, and, and they don't have that kind of uh, access to the educations. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's, this is how we are trying, we're thinking about uh, starting something new here. The future education for our daughter, and then we want to replicate it for other kids too. And that's how I get to know him through as well. Uh, his grandpa was the former minister of education, and he started, you know, after retirement many, many years later, he started a, a pre college program. And um, he was the founder, and along with the two other professors, uh, retired professors from Yale University, where they graduated their PhD, and they started this pre-college program. And first, it was only for him and his twin brother to come and study in the United States. Then they, he thought, why not 
create such opportunity opener for other grandkids as well. So I uh, become a student at the first cohort. Now the program is thriving and shining. So this uh, public service, you know, we came to Kennedy School and uh, the Harvard itself has uh, this very public service oriented. So we want to not only just uh, create a future uh, for our daughter very conveniently in, uh, you know, uh, Cambridge or in US, but uh, why don't we do something about it in Myanmar? What can we do about it? And the timing is uh, very, uh, very interesting as well. The, in 2016, the National Education Strategic Plan uh, came out. And uh, 2016 to 2021, uh, the Myanmar is holistically transforming the education system. Previously, the system that we both grew up into was very robotic learning and the textbooks are very dry, black and white, and you know, everything was uh, learning by heart and there are no colors and a kid like me with ADHD and dyslexic, uh, dyslexia, it was very um, daunting test, you know, very boring, but um, I, I thankfully I survived and then, but uh, many kids didn't survive. So we, um, we wanted to create something, uh, making learning fun, and we both were gamers and we still play games. <laughs> so we want to think of why don't we create something that gamer like, you know, for the education. And this is one the Myanmar transformation of education with the, the government transforming all the curriculum for K-12. And also this, the uh, everybody has a smartphone, you know, in mm -hmm. 2016. So a smartphone is the uh, very personal device. People have it in their hands. It's, it's, some, sometimes it is the first ever individual, you know, uh, device that they own, and it's in every, uh, you know, household. There are at least one phone they have, and it's connected to the internet. So they now see how the world is changing, but they have this hunger and threats, you know, to catch up. But we don't have the opportunity, and we see this challenge as opportunity to using the smartphone, mobile phones, to transform the learning. And uh, we both were gamers, so we want to think like games and then uh, using a mobile phone camera for scanning, you know, and then augmented reality. And uh, his background in very strong in the science and my background in ESL. So we both combined the STEM and ESL uh, subjects, you know, uh, learning programs uh, of our Myanmar started in 2017. And um, now, uh, four years later, um, yeah. Right. And uh, <clears throat> well, we, uh, you know, when we started this two and two put together, you know, mm -hmm. gaming and, and uh, education, uh, it all click uh, because, you know, you know, we, uh, you know, before, before uh, books were invented, you know, the, the, uh, the way that we learned and the way the animals learns, you know, they, they learn it by playing and, and, you know, the, that that has to be uh, connected, and and uh, uh, so we we started to look around and and then you know of course this whole education system that we all familiar with is 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 a huge big games you know you have levels you know that you go through every every years and and you have to have certain points to get to the next level and and you need to have all the subjects pass. So these are games, you know. I was just, uh, um, so, sorry. sorry uh, I I love the how you bring the story of yourself, your daughter, the national system, and your own work. And mm -hmm. uh, so there's a question actually I have for you. So when you are developing this AR VR applications to deliver on phones, mm -hmm. uh, is the content aligned with the national? education standards or national curriculum and is it really to strengthen what mm -hmm. children learn in schools or are you creating a new education outcome yes uh, in 2016 when we started it was a, a full idea nobody believed something you know could come out it was just a, a, a crazy couple's idea 
but in 2017, government starting to appreciate and we signed the memorandum of understanding with the Myanmar Ministry of Education, especially with the uh, Department of Basic Education. As a result, that uh, we built uh, the first ever AR learning app for the grade one English uh, students, which is about 1.2 million students in Myanmar. And that was in 2000, uh, that the 2019, the app came out. And then the re receptance, you know, people really like it. And then COVID-19 happened. So we see the dramatic uh, demand, you know, increasing for this COVID-19. So during COVID-19, the first wave in uh, about uh, May, we were able to launch uh, three other, uh, two, uh, three other apps, like now grade two, grade three, and grade six apps. At each level, we have about uh, 1 million students in Myanmar. So altogether, about 4 million students are now enjoying the free English learning app with the augmented reality. So when they scan the textbooks that they receive free from the government, they also see that this QR to download the app and how to use it. And then they started you know, playing with and then uh, learn it to get, together with their parents and at home because we had no other choice. When we were given no choice, uh, the creativity became our resource. Right. <laughs> and we started you know, uh, learning it. And uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, aligned with the government uh, curriculum, but uh, we don't want to just uh, stay in Myanmar. We want to uh, accelerate and also you know, expand the impact scope. So we also build a set of uh, learning tools uh, with the science, you know, that is uh, complementary to the uh, government textbook, but not necessarily built on the textbooks. So these these subjects, uh, we started selling uh, outside of Myanmar now uh, in the Asia too. The reason we also chose uh, English and science, you know, English and science is quite universal. And everybody has to learn science and elements and, you know, uh, circuits and all this physics stuff. So we build those learning tools that is uh, well, well tested in Myanmar and rounds of iteration and with a very patient uh, Myanmar people. And then we now taking those products to um, region as well. So yes. So, yeah. wait, 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 so wait, I have wait, a... wait, wait, wait. You, you guys <laughs> got extensively connected with the, in the country across grade levels, just like that. You don't work for the government, right? We How, don't. Yeah, so that doesn't happen typically. You know, a, comp a startup company typically doesn't find their apps or software integrated throughout schools within a year or two. So how did that happen? <laughs> uh, the first time we introduced the idea to the Ministry of Education, uh, they were very skeptical, of course, and they were even going to assume me that if you are building the app, you know, based on this, uh, our textbook, we can sue you. I said, yes, but we are, you know, adding the uh, value to the system that you have recently built, the new curriculum and, you know, all that. And then later they became to appreciate and they more and more. So the collaboration with the government is now, especially in the COVID-19 time, not only the apps that we built uh, made it uh, free and, you know, for all the 4 million students in Myanmar, but also the education channel, the TV channel also show the videos that we use, uh, we teach, you know, uh, with our apps as well. So how, how did you know who to contact? I mean, how did you, uh, how did you get yeah. brave enough to contact somebody? Yeah, we, we both were in uh, education fields before too. Uh, I was an elementary school teacher for four years before I did my uh, bachelor degree in the States in Iowa in the middle of fields. And then I went back home and became teacher's trainer, school founder and education policy advocate. And he himself uh, came from a family of educators, especially his grandpa was the former minister of education and the family has a legacy of public service and also this educators you know, in the oh. country. The well noted. Okay. Yes. That explains, well, I'm sorry, Chris. But, I had to get that clarified. If, I can, if I can build on this, though, um, I think if I went to Myanmar and said, I'm from Harvard and I'm here to help you, they would just start laughing, right? I mean, <laughs> what, what do I know about Myanmar? And I think a lot of nonprofit organizations, even very good ones, mm -hmm. suffer from this problem of coming in from the outside. And the fact that you grew up in the country and had voluntarily made the choice to come back and, and help the country, I think that's a kind of credibility that really opens doors and that will let you make a partnership that it might have taken 20 years for some outside group to build up the, the credibility. 
The other quick observation I want to make, and then Young, I, I, it sounds like you have a, another question. Um, I'm really happy when you came back from Cambridge that you didn't bring the MIT philosophy of one laptop per child with you. <laughs> that you were smart enough first to recognize that the cell phone is the delivery infrastructure, not some, you know, outside laptop. And second, you were smart enough to realize that the technology is not magic and that you don't just give somebody a device and then all sorts of wonderful things automatically happen. So I think that that coming to Cambridge when you already knew a lot about education was important so that you didn't drink that Kool-Aid, but instead, you know, you, you came back understanding the infrastructure and understanding the curriculum and, and professional development are the keys, not, not the magic technology. So, so Chris, uh, you know, there's a, a bunch of questions from the audience. I think it's very interesting. One of them, which I won't ask anyway, because when you are developing products mm -hmm. based on the textbook or the curriculum, mm -hmm. uh, in essence, you are finding a different way to teach the content to the students. So, mm -hmm. so in many ways, we are designing this. Are you creating an app that's almost like a teacher and, and the teacher can be replaced? Is that what, can you show us some of your products? Because I would, I'm really curious to say that. And uh, this, by the way, is many, like in, I'm, I'm from China originally, China, the whole East Asia markets has a lot of products, you know, serve as private tutors just to make you become better at uh, what you're supposed to learn in schools. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, the regardless of the uh, education and technology catching up, you know, in the uh, bottom billion um, emerging markets, the role of teacher remains to be relevant. Um, teacher's role is not just to, uh, in, our, in our philosophy, teacher's role is not just to impart the knowledge, but discerning the wisdom, that is the role that teacher plays, and that we really need that. And the technology can only teach the facts and, you know, to build the confidence and build this uh, learning confidence and such, but teachers can teach the other skills, soft skills and moral skills, right. and also this <clears throat> discerning wisdom. That's a very important part of uh, learning, I believe, right. yes. You know, yeah. Um, the uh, we we feel that teachers' uh, times are very valuable, and uh, right now uh, a lot of teachers are spending their time grading the papers and uh, uh, organizing the lessons uh, uh, more than more than you know more more times to take organizing the lesson than they should. And, and, you know, all, all sort of uh, small things that uh, technology can really help them. And, and this is where, where our uh, programs really were helpful. And, and we hope to be more helpful in the future as well. So this is an example of the app. Uh, it is a learning platform. App. We call it uh, uh, Universe. Universe Learning App is a place for the children and, you know, adults and uh, parents, all learners. And this is our uh, tech line. <laughs> so first, uh, they uh, to log in, they create a login and they register, and um, they, they get in uh, freely, no no charge. And thanks to the um, people, uh, also corporate sponsor who believed in us, and they sponsor the development of the app, so we can make it freely available to millions of people every year. No, you know, not just one year. So here, if you look at grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, grade six, you know, all this app, and uh, it is like uh, Netflix. When you uh, download one Netflix and then there are many videos, right? So this, uh, let's say we click uh, grade two or grade three app and you were directed to that, uh, that um, page. And there are other apps that in the process in the pipeline for physics and chemistry and bio and all sorts as we uh, focus on ESL and STEM. But in this platform so far, we only have the English and the, the music app is coming up. I am uh, transcribing uh, the video as well. So Vocab Builder and International Alphabet, these are the ones that we sell, but the free apps are the, the textbook curriculum app. In a bit, it will show you to the uh, app uh, user interface. And we also build uh, 
uh, apps like uh, Intro to Music. So here you see that it's completely free and probably sponsored by Empry, which is one of our corporate uh, partner who sponsor uh, the development of the app. And this is like a learning map. Uh, when you go into their stars uh, and little bar, and those indicate that little bars indicate when the bars is finished and that the, the learner already finished that lesson. And when they receive the one star, two star, three star, it shows the mastery of that lesson. And uh, throughout the entire curriculum, when they reach the five stars, it means that a uh, kids really uh, got their you know uh, learning skills they need to. And it is not only learning the lesson, but also uh, formative assessment and gamifying. So why they are playing and, you know, and they are being tested of their uh, vocabulary skills and grammar and, you know, things like that. And uh, we use the um, positive reinforcement. So the yay and stars and, you know, things like that. So when they scan the textbooks and then the guava, for example, the guava pops up and girl and girls pops up. That's the beauty of augmented reality and, you know, bringing folks into their, uh, you know, learning <laughs> out of the textbook and things like that. Uh, we, we really like 3D because uh, uh, we, we've least that since we were born and everything we touch and we see those are the 3D you know, 3D models and 3D thing, everything. But when we go to the classroom, thing become flat. And, uh, you know, like reading, love to write, it's not how we train our brain. <laughs> but uh, we train our brain with colors and interaction. So we try to incorporate the, the uh, nature into this uh, learning app as well. Yeah. So here uh, they can practice the dialogue many, many times. Uh, I muted so you don't hear, but uh... she is a doctor. M A N G O Mango. So this is for the Great Do English app. There are some songs. I can play So here uh, they click and, you know, learn the phrases and things like that. And the grammar exercises and also there's a, each unit uh, like a learning map. And there is a, another layer. The entire textbook is free. But if they want the extra learning uh, lessons, then this is our business model. And they can buy the coins and to, you know, learn further. And to make the learning, uh, some parents, they are happy if they can get the free uh, textbook for free, that's enough. But some parents, they want to do extra exercise, like extra grammar lesson and extra vocabularies, things like that. So we make the room for that as well. And uh, augmented reality really makes the learning pop. In a, a country like Myanmar, the science lab, uh, we can count in one hand, you know, we don't have science lab. We have about 60,000 schools and about 10 million students in the uh, K-12, you know, basic education system. But the science lab are very rare. So we make use of uh, smartphone cameras to bring the science lab into the classrooms or in the, you know, learning desk. And the stories also become alive with the app as well. So here is uh, just an example of how the app looks like. And it's interactive, not just watching one video after another as a you know, passive learner. They click, they click, they play, and then you know, taking the test or something like that. So this is just an example. Um, so we, we also combine the idea of uh, concept of uh, formative assessments mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the gamifications. Mm -hmm. But so uh, there, there's a, another question, you know, when, you know, apparently, you know, you, you guys are doing AR, you know, there are millions, I, I, I exaggerated, not millions, there are really hundreds of products like this, globally speaking, if you go to Silicon mm -hmm. Valley, go to the US, and uh, uh, everybody's trying to do something like this. I'm sure in China, there are a lot of companies who are doing something quite similar to that. So. I was just curious to say when you're designing this program, what kind of user testing you've done? You know, how 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 do you test the, the, the models to say because you know we face the challenge and there are some content might fit a global audience, some may fit in students in specific conditions, students react differently. So what kind of user testing and how are you building this for different markets? 
Yes, uh, our education team, uh, the Department of Education is uh, very well designed with the uh, teachers and they are, some of them are tutors as well. And they have the children, they have the students that they have been tutoring you know, all along. So they test it uh, before we take it to the market. And we ourselves as a kids at home, digital native for five year old, now almost six years old. And she is very ruthless. She will tell this is, you know, like, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> she wouldn't play, you know, <laughs> things like that. So we have uh, uh, user testing at uh, convenience at home and also our education team uh, has the students that they have been teaching and they take it out. And now, um, so far we have been relying on the uh, kids you know, around us in Django, but uh, we cannot do that extensively all throughout, you know, 14 states and division in the country. But uh, this sample is uh, quite good enough for us to uh, test it. And then uh, there are two other products. One product is totally free, entirely free. It's a partnership with the Naval Ministry of Education. And the other product is the uh, box of flashcards where we sell to the people. And people, when they have to especially take the money out of the pocket and they tell if they don't like it, you know, or what they don't like. <laughs> and the power of as uh, the team is a very rapid iteration. And we have gone through, you know, many rounds of iteration. And the very first few apps that we created in 2018 and we are still going the rounds of you know uh, upgrade and updating so having the team uh, technical team and education team on the house it helps us to go through this uh, user feedback and iteration rounds so you know, i've had, I've had uh, 360 yet interact with my class across mm -hmm. distance and and uh la, 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 they were kind enough to let us have the flashcards locally so that we could experience this directly and it's it's very engaging i mean i'm like you young and kurt i've seen a million of these things this is just a couple levels above the norm in terms of the engagement the colors and the animation and the kind of playful quality to them you know lots of people try to do sesame street stuff but there's only one sesame street and i think that there's just superior design here in, and, and then that becomes a key to scaling because then it's your audience that says, wow, you won't believe what my kid did yesterday. And so now you're not sending out a sales force to say how wonderful you are. It's, it's, your, own, it's your own users who are really excited. Yes. Now that's very strong endorsement from Chris. You better uh, uh, capture that. And and uh, <laughs> I, I I don't mean to dominate the question, but I'm very interested in this because I've been writing and thinking a lot about the future of education after COVID with all this technology. When you have huge abundance of learning resources like this, you know, uh, can children have a different life in school? So, the, you know, so do teachers don't really need to teach because you are teaching probably better. So you mentioned, uh, Lala, that uh, teachers can do more moral, more ethical, uh, different things. Uh, I'm not um, familiar with Myanmar, like how big your classes are, how teachers doing that. Do you think this product is changing how people learn and how teachers teach? Yes. Well, yeah, this is this is our our ultimate goal is is to uh, to actually change the way that we learn and 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 teach, and uh, right now is the 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 global demand for uh, quality education is really really high, and the supply is uh, quite kind of uh, flat uh, throughout the years, and even even before we get this uh, this uh, pandemic uh, uh, situation that we have. Uh, and 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 uh, with with these uh, technologies and the, the the tools that we provide, uh, we, ho we we hope and we'll, we'll be able to, uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, really uh, utilize the the resources of the teachers and the classroom resources uh, much better. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 the doing homeworks is is uh, much different, mm -hmm. and also the. Uh, uh, even the the kids outside of the formal education settings uh, uh, can can benefit uh, almost the the si very similar quality of uh, educations. Mm 
mm-hmm. um, than than the uh, form, uh, formerly uh, school uh, children. We both were born and raised in Yangon, which used to be the capital. We have about six, uh, 5.5 million to 6 million people and where all the opportunities are. And uh, the whole country, uh, we have about uh, 55 uh, to 58 million people. And when they want the best possible education, they all have to come to Yango. And uh, it didn't occur to me as such, and before I become a teacher, before I become a mom, when other people ask me, oh, my daughter is this age now, and where should I send? And I just named a school, good school in Yango, it was okay. But when we became a parent ourselves, you know, sending the kid to faraway place and, you know, for education, so it was very, it's, it's heartbreaking, you know, I, I can't do that. I don't think I can do that. Uh, so bringing the education opportunity to the neighborhood, uh, now in COVID time to the homes, you know, home-based learning. And that's very important because uh, we cannot just, you know, send the kids to the, the best possible education system, you know, regardless of the, uh, the, the pandemic. <laughs> so that's one thing. Another thing is we have been trying to solve the problem that our country has. Uh, the problem is we have this uh, political unrest and this uh, uh, civil a war, you know, uh, we have 138 different languages speaking people, different ethnic minorities. We are the majority, we are Burman, but um, the country's uh, political economy is totally based on the extraction economy. So the pie sharing of resources are never fair and shared. So the, the fighting, you know, uh, c- continues. So those who lived in the uh, IDP internally displaced uh, camp or those who were trapped in the, you know, war zone, they don't have the learning opportunity. We want to make it something about it. But previously, the timing was not right. We have no other tools. There's a, a century long problem. But now with a new tool and new approach, we're trying to bring the learnings to their palms, you know, with the smartphone. And another challenge that we have in Myanmar is the internet is not everything yet. Internet is still expensive and it's not available. So what we make our learning app is uh, making it free, uh, making it uh, selective offline. So they don't have to be online all the time. When they are in the, uh, you know, uh, not city center, but the, you know, uh, the uh, where they have the internet access, they can download the app, activate the app, and when they are back in the village, when back in the village or back in the war zone or back in the IDB camp, they don't have the internet, they can stay work the app, you know, functionally or work, working well. That's the challenge that we were able to solve, and we're very happy to do that because uh, this is a challenge n- n- not the other kids in other countries don't have, but our kids have it. So if we rely on the internet connectivity, then um, they won't have the uh, education opportunity. So we were able to solve the another level of challenge on this uh, uh, selective offline. And um, yeah, we're quite okay. uh, pleased. Yeah. Just, sir, th- this story is very fascinating to me. I, I'm, I sound like I'm dominant in the whole interview because uh, <laughs> uh, what, what I'm been thinking a lot about is given the access to the internet, you know, it may be small right now, we still have a digital divide, but a country like um, Myanmar. And uh, last week we had people from Nepal, you know, we have you know, countries from a, a lot of countries. We know education is the only way toward a better future. We have wars, we have battles, civil wars, fighting, everything. And, and by the way, I have to say this, you know, Pune I just announced Joe Biden is now the elected president of America. We just find that result. Okay, so this is very historical interview today. We have a <laughs> historical, you guys come in. So this is very, very significant. The 46th president of the United States. But we need education to maintain a democracy, to drive this. So what you are doing is what I'm hoping truly going to change how we think about schooling of education. And, uh, you know, last week we had students from Nepal accessing MOOCs and other things to learn English. Your students are accessing this apparent and crisis, very engaging things. Do you think, do you think you will get into, or the Minister of Education will say, okay, 360 products are so good. Teachers, Let's think about how to work with students in other ways. Do you think that's going to happen? It's uh, we're beginning to see <laughs> that in uh, some of our pilot schools. So last year, you know, academic year before the COVID nineteen craziness, uh, teachers uh, with the 
projector or TV in the classroom. They connect their smartphone and with the TV. And the classroom students, they, they, they like to see interactiveness. And you know, the whole world is very motivating and active. Uh, ad active. And when they class in, in the classroom, when teachers started you know, scanning the textbook with the uh, smartphone and it shows on the projector screen and it shows on the TV and so the kids were very happy. So that's how we want to help the teachers as well. My mom was a teacher, I was a teacher, all my aunts were teachers and they, they had to, I don't want to call it waste, but they had to waste a lot of their time on the, you know, uh, this uh, correction and uh, just daunting right. tests that we can now help with the uh, technology and they can focus right. more on what's really important that only teacher can teach. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we will hope and we, we like it to be uh, the our governments mm -hmm. and, and these uh, large institutions to adopt these uh, 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 our problem, uh, our our solutions, and you know, quite in, in a large number. Uh, but uh, also the our challenge is also that you know uh, the way that the policymakers are thinking is a, a little bit different from uh, entrepreneurs are thinking, and they are a little bit more risk reverse, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, based on the situations that we have had uh, for many decades. And it's it's better to not uh, do something that is new and risky, and and so we are we are more uh, relying now on the uh, uh, grassroots and bottom up approach as opposed to the uh, top down. Uh, that, of the that's that's why my question was from earlier: How are you able to do that? Now I have a couple follow ups, say two three follow ups. And by the way, I'm a little bit jealous. <laughs> I had a software company uh, 15 years ago or so, um, uh, and I didn't get, <laughs> I built a survey share uh, one year too late. Survey Monkey became very popular around the world. Oh. Uh, <laughs> it still exists, survey share still exists. It still has a free version, but I no longer own it. Um, so I am a little jealous on, uh, my entrepreneurial hat is jealous. My educational <laughs> hat wants to know more. And um, three things, um, how are you able to ramp up so quickly with content do the developers exist at the governmental level, the teacher level, as well as the, the company? So you're working with development teams within the country with your development team, or do you spec out a vision and then try and sell it to the, to the country? I mean, are you working in partnership with them when you build all this? I mean, you've ramped up a lot of content, but a lot of interactive contents. That takes creativity, time, effort, and risk, as you just said. Um, yes. Well, can you comment on, on the content buildup? Yes. Uh, after after graduated from Harvard, I was quite lucky enough to receive this uh, Google Innovation Grant. So I went to Silicon Valley and enrolled at the Global Solution Program at the Singularity University. And during the Singularity University, I went through a lot of the uh, hackathons and also in, in the Silicon Valley uh, as a whole, they have a lot of hackathons over the weekend. I really love that culture of uh, rapid learning and rapid iteration, you know. So when I came back to Myanmar, we started throwing the hackathons for free for you know, ah. And then those people who show up at the hackathon, they are the young people who wants to learn. They don't care about the certificate because I, do, I told the F friend, I'm not giving you any certificate. You are not earning anything to come and study here, but you will learn for sure. So they came and that's how I get to know the some individuals uh, who are very curious to learn about the new things and who are curious to build new things. And then we trace them back to the university. So we we mapped out, identifying the uh, technology Brilliant. university in Myanmar. <laughs> who are really quite you know, uh, advanced. So we also partner with those technology university and build these internship programs. And then we take the students from those uh, uh, you know, university, the brightest, like let's say they, they were 150 applicants and we take like 10 and you know, very rigorous uh, exam. And then they took it and then we train them for three months. And by the time they graduate, we have a job waiting for them. And they go back to school to graduation and come back and become our workers. So oh, that's how I build, ah. that's how we build the talent development pipelines. And all the entire development team is uh, Burmese, yes. Mm -hmm. And we have this uh, in-house uh, training so, model as well. Yeah, that, that is our, our uh, secret sauce, <laughs> uh, our uh, competitive oh. advantages. Uh, so, so we gave away two secrets today already. Biden <laughs> presidency and you guys running your hackathon camps to get talent pools built up uh and that that might be the way 
that you scale this within other countries. You offer those hackathon camps within Thailand or within Nepal or wherever. And um, so that's gonna be my third question. My second question is what, what philosophy are you building these products from and your influence? I feel as though, and maybe I'm wrong, but it's not solely your training in graduate school in the US and it's not solely uh, what you learned growing up. It's somewhere in between. Um, can you describe your philosophy and how you built that uh, over time? Uh, both philosophy and frustration, I guess. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the education system we went through, uh, uh, we also came from the parents and aunts, you know, and our grandparents who are educators in the country. And there are things that we were frustrated. We wish we could change, but the timing was not right. And as an entrepreneur, we we were we look at a thing not just as a challenge, but also you know uh, opportunity. Every challenge is opportunity to. Uh, develop or you know transform so this uh, risk taking daring to t take risk and uh, we come from nothing um, we we don't uh, how to say that uh, we don't build this you know to to become a next you know uh, billionaire, billionaire. billionaire. <laughs> we're educators we can go back to do the teaching you know that that's the fallback <laughs> um, so we are quite um, sure you know uh, it's okay we can and uh, and I did the that, by the way. I, I went. I sold the company. I became that, so I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Right. And uh, having the freedom to decide on our own, you know, uh, we we really um, do this uh, bootstrapping, and you know, we we don't take the. Uh, we haven't had a series A round yet. I was just telling Chris that recently we're thinking about having a series A round. So we were just bootstrapping and going very lean uh, with ourselves. So we don't have a. a you know, big BODs, you know, uh, telling us what to do. So we both can uh, discuss and then, okay, let's go ahead. <laughs> and I am uh, from education, very uh, visionary, and he is very practical, you know, product development and very innovative. And so we kind of uh, combine our niches. Yes. So, so I have, a, thanks, yeah. Kurt. Um, I have another question. When this is really where Punia, if he were, uh, would be, because Punia has been talking a lot about the five spaces of design. So in essence, you are, you're designing a, a product, but at the same time, you're designing a culture, a system. So mm -hmm. imagine because of COVID that all schools said, okay, yeah, you guys are great. So you're really affecting the system and the mm -hmm. culture. So I was just wondering what kind of uh, belief you have about the education we should have because most people design teaching tools or learning tools without a broader vision of what should education be like. I'm just curious to say, where would that be? What, what, what's your education? Not just teaching and learning because you are affecting the education system. Yes, uh, let me put it in a, um, a visual way. I'm a very visual learner. When we watch the TV, we have a remote. We turn on and we see and we learn, right? That's one way. And but when we have a phone and we can communicate, it's a two-way communication. But when we have, uh, you know, uh, when we have a society where the students can also be part of their education and that is co-creation and that's multiple way. And that's the route that we really like to go forward you know, in the future. And I think it's not fair for us to be just the creator of the curriculum of the next generation and their life will be way different because uh, the world is changing very, very fast, rapidly. And what we know mm -hmm. is all knowledge already. So I really want to invite the students to be part of this uh, creating curriculum for the future. But there is uh, many steps ahead. But what we can do now is this uh, two-way communication and you know, and also students uh, believing themselves. This uh, confidence building is very important part of learning. For us, is uh, we have such confidence. We came to study in the States and we had a scholarship opportunity. Uh, we have confidence to learning new things. I'm not coder. He is not coder. Uh, he's a scientist. I'm a teacher. What we know about technology, nothing. But we are able to, you know, like crack it, hack it, and learn it together with the process because we have this confidence. And that this new generation, and they need such confidence and also opportunity to hack it, learn it, and, you know, build things that they want to see in the future. Right. So, so if for I me, can like, jump in just, yeah. just to make a point and then, and then, let you go on. Um, 
there's an interesting opportunity for research here. Uh, and, and I've seen a long debate take place essentially about cultural relevance. So on the one side, you see people who say English is English, math is math. You just design a good curriculum for that and people everywhere should use it and they're going to learn from it. Right. <laughs> and then the other side says, no, cultural relevance is really important because the examples that you use and the contexts that provide relevance are, are quite different from place to place. So I, I'd, I'd love to get your comment on, on that contrast and, and where you would position your work. Right. Um, well, um, you know, going back to, uh, I think it might answer some of your questions. You know, the, uh, I, you know, in terms of philosophy, you know, I will go back to my childhood and and some of our um, some of my earliest memories is is of of wonder. Uh, our childrens come with curiosity, you know. And, and along the way, we kill these curiosities uh, and, and, uh, and the education system uh, nowadays is more like uh, telling them what to know as opposed to they themselves trying to figure things out. And, and we try to go back to that and because it's, it's such a wonder of uh, to be in, in, in between knowing and not knowing and always facing something unknown is, is, is always trying to figure out. And that's, that's such a, you know, we, we just want to have that experience or even if you are 90 years old, you know, you still have that edge. And, and that, that, what, uh, that is what the education should be. And, 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 and that's, that's how we want to build uh, our products to have our users to, to have that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the beginning of my. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kurt, you, you're going to ask a question? You're on mute, Kurt. Yeah. So I, I was going to ask the question about scalability within other countries. And um, it was already asked in the chat window. Priyank is asking, what's your plans for, you know, expanding this and scaling this around and where might you go next and, and how will you approach that? In uh, 2018, we built a product called International Alphabet. Uh, it's a, a build dedication to our daughter. Uh, she goes to an international school, uh, the multi-language school. So it's a Japanese and she is learning Chinese and, you know, French and uh, Spanish and English. And she comes home and expects us to teach her, you know, all these languages. We have no idea. We barely speak two languages. So we, we outsmart her and we, you know, build this project of learning vocabularies in eight languages that she's learning and beyond. And that product took it to the market, you know, in the regional, especially the ASEAN uh, languages. So that it's an uh, infra that we have. And since we're building this ESL and also this uh, uh, the, the STEM, you know, uh, the science language, science uh, subjects, and we put those languages, you know, in there. When they learn about the elements, for example, it's uh, pretty universal. And uh, what this element can be found in what product, you know, what, what uh, things around us, uh, it's quite uh, universal. And we use those uh, examples and, uh, with the different languages we have. So, so for example, for the elements, we have about 30 cards to see. Right, something, yeah. 30. Yeah. 30 cards, yeah, 30 cards with the, you know, uh, elements. And then elements. when they uh, scan this uh, card front and back, they see that all the, you know, uh, description about the card, the, the elements and how, where can they find and things like that. But when they put the two cards together, it becomes the, uh, interaction compounds, that yeah. compounds the, yeah. and the kids wonders they really like to put this card and that card and together looking for the you know different uh by bi 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 uh, binary compounds binary yeah. compounds so things like that and then that's it's a Myanmar language that is an english language that is a you know uh vietnamese and things like that so something that can go uh at skill uh, we chose subject intentionally as well 
um, we don't do the Burmese literature and we don't do the Burmese, you know, like geography or economy, but uh, the STEM and English. We now have another audience question for Robert Nelson. He asks, how will students know that they have acquired sufficient knowledge to, trans to transition to the next level? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so the previous video that we were showing, uh, it has the uh, little bar. It shows that the students complete this chapter or lessons. And then when they receive one star, two star, three stars, there is a maximum they really uh, completed. So it kind of formative assessment in a gamifying way that we embedded. They think they are playing games, but actually they are being tested. When they get the three stars and uh, for adults, a uh, glance of the screen, we know that the students already, you know, mastered this uh, chapter or units. And then throughout the course, we also put the big five stars. So so when they receive the big five stars, it shows that the students has uh, some level of mastery or if they have the four stars or three star or no star at all and uh, gamify uh, assessment system uh, for media assistance throughout the course, we put it in. So we've, we've talked a lot about the students and the student engagement, the student construction of knowledge. Um, how, how much are teachers a part of this? And is there some kind of professional development that teachers need in order to really help students get the most out of it? Yes, uh, that's, that's a very important question. Uh, actually, we plan to do the teachers trainings this year, which together with the Ministry of Education and then COVID happened. So we couldn't do the teachers training. So teachers are now during the COVID with their smartphone, download the app and teaching themselves. And uh, students, like the students, are also uh, downloading and learning by themselves. But we hope that uh, when they stay, you know, uh, rest, we can do this uh, cohort again with the teachers training. Last year, we did uh, with the 20 pilot schools, uh, teachers training and how they bring those uh, learning to the classrooms and, you know, uh, create the classroom interactive. But that was only based on one app. But this year, we have so many apps available, but uh, we don't have the teachers training yet, but we really like to uh, build a, a, a course for that. Right. Yeah, the, the teacher rules were uh, changed quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. And uh, teachers are not going to be the one who is assessing the students. And the, the students are going through their levels uh, in, in their games and teachers are going to be beside them and helping them uh, in, in the area where they got stuck. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that's, that's what, what they're supposed to be doing, but you know, in regular setting, it doesn't usually happen. But if, if you can uh, use our system like that, you know, it, I think it can really uh, go into that direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. And slow learner like me, um, it takes me uh, two times, three times to learn a concept. But once it's there, I, I really grab it and you know learn it and students like me they need the opportunity to go back many times as they want you know uh, without um, hurting other students in the classrooms and so we hope that this can take it to the mainstream now it's all happening during COVID uh, not all but uh, most of the new apps that we've created uh, during COVID out of the necessity out of the demand and oops <laughs> And that's, that's a uh, electricity, electricity outage. outage, and that's <laughs> happened in Yemo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I just use my phone now to light our cell. <laughs> that's that's oh, I'm glad. I'm glad you have a power supply for the computer, so you can continue <laughs> to be part of the program. Right. That that's a real another reality. We can rely on the internet, no the electricity. You know, even in the big city, most cosmopolitan city, Yangon, with the six million people and all the uh, embassies and you know all the international uh, thing, and we still have the electricity outage. You know, like that. <laughs> so we have to build a system that is relevant to us to to yeah. our problems. You know, not only. Uh, offline selective, you know, uh, the inter selective online and also this, uh, you know, the, if it is based on the web, you know, computer, we can afford it and the electricity is not reliable, <laughs> but the phone so, we can charge with the right. solar. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the thing, you know, we, we developed this uh, programs and, and uh, solutions for Myanmar. 
but uh, that's also the reality in in a lot of places in in, in the world you know in africa in the other part of uh, asia and and some some part of latin america and 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 we hope that especially with some of the programs being uh, very universal in terms of uh, you know, the language and the uh, uh, math and science, you know, and uh, we, we, we like to, to continue on, on uh, you know, expanding to, to yeah, the other to markets. Yeah. To other, other uh, especially markets. the emerging markets and mm -hmm. the developing markets. Let me get a final, final thing. Yeah, kind of, a quick question, because we're, we're running out of time. Yeah. It's, more yeah. of a comment. Uh, it seems like you're really wedded to self-directed uh, educational psychology plays a huge role in what you're doing, engagement, the motivational principles that you've talked about, self-identity as a learner, self-concept, but also self-directed learning skills, not only the students using the tools, but the teachers getting trained because you can't go in and do the PD professional development right now. They have to download the app, download the training and train themselves. So uh, in my research right now, I'm studying SDL, self-directed learning, and, and we're looking at what are the kinds of things that are, are embedded in online learning tools and technologies to help learners self-direct. Have you thought about the self-directed learning principles that are embedded in your system or in, in the training of, of teachers, or, and are you trying to find ways to help in that regard? Uh, I don't know the terminology or uh, pedagogy term, but what we like to build is the, the confidence in each learner's uh, you know, inner. When we had this uh, learning confidence, we are able to uh, take the challenge and turn it into the, you know, um, the solution, or we don't just stop at the challenge, we take it to the next level. You know? What can we do about it? So that it's a uh, very, um, center to what we built. We want to have our learners or our daughter have this confidence that she can learn it and she can master it and she can, you know, uh, help others learn it as well. So kind maybe self-directed, uh, I don't know the terminology, but uh, the center is uh, learning confidence, yes. Thank you. So I, I want to thank you for, for being part of the program and, and even being so prepared that you could handle a power outage. Um, <laughs> And, and I also want to say that I'm, I'm very struck by your humility. Um, you know, you meet a lot of people who've been far less successful than you have, and they're just so proud of themselves. And they, they feel that they found revealed truth and they understand how to change everything in the world and so on. And I think, I think your humility and, and willingness to learn and, and not declaring victory is a really important part of your success. And I just want to say that, you know, I think, I think you really are a lighthouse in terms of a lot of opportunities to use advanced technologies in developing countries as well as developed countries. Jan, uh, Kurt, do you want to have any final remarks here? Well, I would like to, um, to comment and then introduce next episode. I, I think, um, the power outage is just amazing. I, I, I really want to our audience from wherever they are is to really understand we are in a different world than 30 years ago, than even 20 years ago. And this is amazing. You know, from uh, the story, we have a lot of global South countries who have come up to see there's innovation, there is silver lining, there is hard, but the internet is here and we can reach, we can create new possibilities. We can create new educational pathways. I, I think that's, that's something I always want our people to understand. I'm from a very poor village in China. Uh, I was born in 1960s. I did not have access to your fancy things, but uh, you know, you, you, if, you, if I did, I bet I would be a different person. But what you're doing is amazing, okay? And there's a, an abundance of this. You've learned very good things from, I think, Chris, I guess. So you're, and Chris talk about um, self-directed learning. That's another area you might eventually, like Punia would suggest, move towards to build online communities. Students need to break away from the local communities so they can drive different. I think we have a global learning ecosystem in the making. That's what I think we, we need to, capitalize on that. If our show does one thing, 
it is to drive that idea, a global learning ecosystem. I, I think that that's something it's coming, it's happening. It's not to everybody, but COVID-19 has facilitated with that. So next week, we bring one of the other makers. Uh, there's a group of schools several years ago, they created something called the Global Online Academy. Global Online Academy. These schools started with private elite schools from Jordan, from the US, from uh, China, different places. What they've been doing is to trying to allow schools to share courses. So if you're in a King's Academy in Jordan, you can take a course from say uh, Punahou in Hawaii. And you know, Punahou can take a course, maybe it's another school. So they enable their teachers to develop courses with the idea of students across different places, take these courses. It is a really amazing idea that is in, you know, to make everybody recognize each school is not sufficient. Our life is the world. We can take courses from other places. And we're lucky to have the executive director uh, next week, as well as one of the board members who is also a, princ also a principal from Ponoho School, one of the beginning schools to join us next week to talk about the Global Online Learning Academy. Thank you very much. Chris, you wanna end this? I just wanna say again, thank you and, and uh, get some rest. I know it's <laughs> late there uh, right. and, and please keep us posted because your work is very, very exciting. So thank you.